Well, clearly it's standing room only in the auditorium this morning. Um, so thank you all for coming. If you want to come down the front, like, don't feel as if uh, you have to sit up the back, you can. But if you want to join us down the front, you're more than welcome. Uh, welcome along to my training journey. This is uh, going to be uh, an interesting kind of reflection over the next hour or so, uh, looking at registrars and the experiences through the training program uh, through ACRAM. Obviously, uh, as future registrars, I suppose, in the audience, and there's students and uh, medical instructors, there's training officers, there's a kind of an eclectic blend of people. Uh, we should get some great insights into the journey of these registrars uh, through ACRAM. So uh, to officially open uh, this part of the um, plenary session. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the representative uh, of one of our uh, sponsors, James Cook's University, who did a fantastic event last night with the Future Gen networking event. It's uh, nice to welcome him back. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Richard Murray. Thank you. Uh, so look, it's just fabulous the opportunity to share uh, life experiences uh, around uh, what it is to have a journey to be a rural doctor. Uh, I'm here uh, uh, as a very proud sponsor of this event uh, for James Cook University. Uh, James Cook University, this is sort of a way of looking at the world. It's a tropical way of looking at the world, actually. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, because it's sort of our, our footprint. The tropical world uh, uh, is actually where most of the global health action is, is about. So in terms of a career uh, that might be about rural, remote, underserved, uh, tropical uh, is the great underserved population now and into the future. Uh, global health is essentially tropical health, really, the agendas we care about. So we're very committed to this. Um, the, uh, as you might know too, uh, about three years ago, we took on general practice training for this small area of the country, about twice the size of New South Wales. Uh, and I'd done um, uh, 1.6 million people. Um, and actually, it's a huge opportunity that we're already realising because the, uh, we are uh, without, uh, by a long shot, actually, we don't often say this, but we are by a long shot Australia's most successful university in producing doctors, dentists and others who go on and work in remote uh, rural and regional communities, by far. Uh, and so the opportunity to really join up the dots uh, and have a vertically integrated training pipelines where we get to know people deeply all the way through, you know, K to 12 and beyond, um, uh, is a fantastic thing. What's more, the notion of aligning this to priority community needs, uh, utilising our so undergraduate medical students uh, through uh, junior doctors and on to vocational training and general practice, and of course facilitating other regionally based specialist training options as well, uh, grow your own workforce, that's what we're trying to do, through this model of, uh, of, uh, med of uh, community engagement geographically distributed medical education and training aligned to priority community needs. So that's, that's the brand, that's what we do. Uh, the truth is, you know, we're rural doctors running all of this stuff. We're the vampires in charge of the blood bank. It's fantastic. So, so uh, we really enjoy the, the journey, enjoy the opportunity to be here. I, I would say that um, uh, I'd really encourage people who like stories to hop onto this website, easy to remember, GMT, edu, au, have a look for the videos. Particularly have a look at the homework. Have a look at the one with Lewis Peachy and see if you're interested in, in anaesthetics as well as optional health uh, after that video or, or the many other amazing stories uh, that we're collecting. And certainly if any of you are interested in any aspect of education, training, placement, work, service with us, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Because uh, fundamentally, uh, this is what we're on about. So thank you very much. Good on you. Uh, thank you, Richard. And uh, to welcome you from uh, the registrars themselves from the, on behalf of the Registrar Committee, could you please join me in welcoming Nick Jones. Uh, hello, everyone. Today's my first meeting, so I'd like to do acknowledgement to the traditional peoples of this land in which we meet today, uh, elders past, present and emerging. My name's Nick. I'm an independent pathway registrar of ACRAM and I'm part of the registrar committee. We are wearing blue shirts here at this year's conference and you can find us at the trade hall 
in the crowd, potentially in the toilet, but most likely at the barista. So please come along and meet us. We are looking for any interested students and trainees to join our committee and to active, have an active voice in your training journey. We're interested to hear about what you'd like to have for RMA 2019 in reference to your training journey. Uh, and we would appreciate your input. So please enjoy your training journey. I'm not sure the toilet is uh, an official meeting room, uh, Nick, but you know, look, that could be an interesting conversation to have with you. It'd be awkward, but, uh, but conversations make things happen. Yes, all right. we learnt that from the guys at Orange Sky yesterday. Uh, so let's get to our uh, first of uh, the registrars. Uh, so please welcome uh, to the stage Dr. Jude Cruz. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Akram, for inviting me to share my, uh, my training journey with you all. So, let's see. Right, so, in the words of that renowned inspirational speaker, Buzz Lightyear, um, my training journey has felt that it's taken me to infinity and beyond. Um, I studied medicine at Charing Cross Hospital in London, gaining my MBBS in 1983. I completed my um, internship a year later, and then three years in a vocational training scheme um, to train to be a GP. This was completed in London, suburbia. Um, that's where I met and married my first wife, Ellen. I, I call her my first wife, we're still married, but I like to keep her on her toes. And um, Ellen was to be rather instrumental in my move to Australia some 25 years later. I then um, joined my brother, elder brother in partnership in Reading, uh, in Berkshire, where I remained for the next 24 years. I, um, set, um, in, during that time, I became a GP endoscopist and I set up my own community diagnostic endoscopy service, of which I'm still clinical lead, and thanks to the wonders of modern day technology. I also served 13 years in Reading Prison, not as an inmate, but as uh, the GP working with young offenders. And I further developed my interest in mental health, substance misuse, and forensic psychology. I became the clinical lead in mental health in my locality where I worked for about four years. I still maintain my license to practice in the UK uh, with the General Medical Council undergoing annual appraisal and cyclical revalidation in order to do so. Right, well I better move on now. I've got nine more slides to go and five and a half minutes or thereabouts. So, top one, there we go. So, um, a brave new world. So after about 30 years of working in the NHS with all its various challenges, and probably more importantly, following an amazing family holiday visiting family in WA, Ellen suggested, requested, that we consider a move to Australia to experience the Australian way of life. I felt there was a need and the time was right for this change, so began the lengthy and challenging process of obtaining an appropriate visa and having my medical, medical qualifications recognized by the Australian Medical Committee. There was also the need to gain fellowship of an Australian medical college, and I was recommended to apply for a place on the specialist pathway um, to fellowship of the Royal Australian College of General Practice. Finally, all was in order, and it was time to take the plunge, that leap in faith that brought me to a GP practice in Australind, WA, in January 2012, on the specialist pathway to fellowship of the Royal College. There we go. Right. Um, embracing diversity. So, bowler hats and brollies were, and city life with unpredictable English weather was traded for Aussie bush hats, beaches, the outback, and the promise of sunshine for most of the year. Now, you may be thinking this is Rama 18. Um, we are Akram. Why is he going on about the Royal College of General Practice? Well, suffice to say, my initial placement didn't work out as expected. The Royal College had overlooked the fact that I did not have a suitably identified supervisor and mentor, which I came to realize left me floundering for my first two years as a, as a registrar. I then realized how vital such supervision and mentorship was. The RAC GP then gave me the impossible ultimatum of completing all of their assessments within a six week period. So, it seemed I'd come to the end of the road, literally shot down in flames. I didn't know who to turn to for advice and support, 
the RACGP seemed very distant and remote indeed. So, which way now? It really felt like that in my head. These arrows were going everywhere, over there, nowhere, somewhere, not sure, uncertain, distant. Anyway, um, in my desperation, I spoke to a medical educator, Mike Eaton, who the RACP, RACGP had sent out to assess me as part of the routine assessments. But Mike was both a fellow of the Royal College and of Akram, and our encounter had been most serendipitous indeed. He was supportive, encouraging, and offered advice. Mike expanded the virtues that Akram had to offer. In short, I decided to switch from the specialist pathway to the independent pathway to Fellowship of Akram and successfully gained a place commencing in, in February 2015. In truth, I was none the wiser really what lay ahead, but at least I knew that there was someone at the end of a telephone, at the end of, a, uh, of an email to, to answer my queries. Finally, I, I felt a sense of belonging and uh, a sense of making sense of it all, inclusion, um, friendship, um, factions. There was, it, was, it was just good to finally feel secure. Then began the long and winding road. And indeed, it was a long and winding road. And as, as with any other journey, I wasn't always sure what lay around the next corner. I've been asked to talk about some of the challenges I faced. I think making it all work um, to progress towards Vacram involves a lot of hard work. And for most of us, we're still holding down full-time jobbing GP jobs or other clinical work. Um, the rural and remote context, if you've never experienced it, London, suburbia, it doesn't prepare you for rural and remote Australia. Um, it's so hard to imagine what it is like. The specific health needs of indigenous people, a whole new way of communicating and understanding people. In terms of my achievements, I felt that developing and enhancing my skills, learning new skills, I learned that you're never too old to learn. If the passion is there, you will find a way to succeed. At this point, I would make a plea on behalf of those who find it hard to progress. I feel I need to speak out for those who struggle to progress their fellowship. Th these are excellent doctors with a wealth of experience who for some reason fail to progress despite tremendous cost to themselves, both in terms of effort and financial. To the training officers, medical educators and men mentors, I would ask that you please maintain that personal touch. If Mike hadn't been there at crucial times for me to turn to for advice and support, I would have been left floundering. Check our understanding, try to understand what our difficulties are. The process can appear overwhelming, and this can be the difference between a would-be fellow and a struggling registrar. In terms of assessment tips for registrars, I think be clear of the process, what's involved and by when. You must plan ahead. If you intend to take out such options as study groups and mock exams, these need to be booked well in advance. Places run out, it's too late if you don't get a, a placement. Try and maintain links with fellow registrars through the registrar forum. You need that peer support, study groups, exchanging experiences. Ask for clarification and help from your training officers, medical educators, peers in your chosen um, advanced speciality training. Um, they are really excellent. They will really help you. My chosen AST was in mental health. Um, in short, because I have run out of time technically, um, I just figured that with a sound mind, you can cope with a broken body. The other way around, broken mind, sound body, it just doesn't work that well. I felt that the skills I, I've learned in mental health have helped me make sense of my own life, my relationships with my patients, family, friends. Hence, mental health seemed the obvious way to go. So, journey's end, ascending the steps to the pinnacle, the temple of wisdom and knowledge, um, or just a new beginning. So every story has an end, but in life, every ending is just a new beginning. And certainly, it's definitely not journey's end, maybe a time for a breather. Um, and we're better than Darwin, you know, croc croc crocodile uh, cove, cage of death, swimming in rock pools, couldn't get better. Um, Training journey has taken me across Australia. Akram has given me the chance to go to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, um, Perth, Darwin. Um, it has, but it's only scratched the surface, and it's given me the insights into my strengths and weaknesses. It's provided me with the opportunity and desire to keep on learning. But there is a need to be realistic about one's own abilities. 
um, and capabilities, but it's also important to know that the extent of one's efforts and aspirations are actually what limits one's potential and ultimate achievement. So taking you back to my land of my birth, Mahatma Gandhi, a man is but a product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes. Thank you all, and I wish you all all the very best for your future career and professional development. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get to uh, throw a question out from the floor, but I do like the, the comparison between uh, London and uh, rural uh, Australia, where Mind the Gap has a totally different meaning. It doesn't <laughs> refer to Medicare difference uh, in London. A any questions? Any questions? Any questions from the floor? Any questions? Um, can I just ask, what, I will ask one, what uh, do you feel was one of the key advantages to the the Akron pathway, but what, what do you kind of walk away with and go, you know what, that's, it's, I've got that because I did it through this pathway? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really that uh, wide breadth of experience that you're expected to gain from Akron. Um, we are rural um, generalists, uh, specialists, and it was daunting to be able to find time to fit in three months of anaesthetics, six months of ED, um, six months of uh, psychiatry. But thankfully, Akram are very accommodating. They, they will work with you. So um, I had to plan ahead, though. I was working in mental health. In, um, I run a GP clozapine clinic in, in my um, hometown in Bunbury. Um, I'm involved in mental health with substance misuse services. I'm one of two GPs that work in the uh, drug dependency unit there. I also work with mental health in, in, in Headspace. So, um, yeah, I think Akram gave me just that unique opportunity, really, of that breadth of experience. Uh, Jude, thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Jude Cruz. Well, I just mentioned that um, time, tide, and Qantas wait for no man, so I've got to shoot off with my team right now. Okay, that's Thank right. you very much. No, that's Good right. luck to the other presenters. We upgraded, we upgraded your flight from Tiger for that exact reason. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker. Uh, please make a welcome, Dr. Tina Downton. All right. Um, I'll try and be as entertaining as my predecessors. Um, so this was what I was given to have a chat about. So I'll run through them um, and try not, um, I guess my story is probably a little bit more mainstream than um, I guess from a, a Australian um, raised and grown background, but we'll see how we go. From my, I guess, prior to starting my um, training with ACRAM and with general practice training, I guess I felt that I'd um, covered a little bit of um, Australia, done a bit of um, placements up in the Territory, um, different parts of New South Wales, um, did a city placement in Brisbane. But from the culmination of them, I think they helped guide me towards doing a rural career path. Um, I felt a lot more comfortable in rural settings doing placements where I could do a lot more hands-on and had stronger relationships with mentors. So that led me on to doing general practice training. Um, and I was also fortunate to do um, placements with the John Flynn placement program that also gave me positive exposures to rural practice. Why I chose Akram, I guess I was familiar with Akram because I was a John Flynn student. I'm also a bonded medical student, so they were involved with the um, support programs. The curriculum's focused on producing rural generalists, and that seemed like the type of doctor I wanted to become. I think Akram actively champions rural medicine, and I think being part of a, a college that supports our profession um, is important so that we know that um, they're gonna continually help support our profession um, maintain sustainability and viability into the future um, and grow. Um, ability to undertake some assessments locally. So you'll find out during my talk that I was also a, an RACGP trainee where you often have to travel to the bigger cities to undertake assessments, but I was able to um, do um, three of my assessments locally with one of my practice managers um, supervising me to make sure I didn't cheat. Um, there's more flexibility in the ACRAM pathway regarding the timing in order to sit assessments. With RSCGP, you have to go through in a particular order to do one assessment to the other, whereas with ACRAM, it just gives you that, that opportunity to, to pick which assessments work best for you. You get them under your belt before you move on. 
Um, and overall, coming out the other end of it, I feel that ACRAM assessments test real-world clinical reasoning better than the RACGP. Um, I, I guess passing the assessments, I feel more confident that I can manage more situations in a rural setting um, than, I guess, coming through the assessments of the um, RACGP. So I was a dual trainee and I'm often asked why did I do dual training? Um, and part of that was the fact that uh, I was the only ACRAM registrar at my medical practice when I was in my GPT1, GP2, T2 um, terms. And so when I wanted to study, I wanted to have study buddies and to have study buddies, I needed to study with my RACGP colleagues. So I found going through the RACGP pathway helped give me the study group I needed. Um, essentially, um, if you do both pathways, you graduate the same, um, but you pay twice as much. Um, and RSCGP does have good learning resources, and I think um, being able to access both college materials and work out which suits my learning style better has been an advantage. Um, challenges and achievements during training. I guess most rural doctors will realise that when you're training in a community, you make the local paper. Um, so I was in the paper a couple times, and I, I guess it, it can be a challenge being fairly known in the communities, but it's also a reward um, in that the community appreciates having doctors in their town, and the sense of um, relationship you develop with the community encourages you to stay. Um, I was also involved with the Rural Doctors Association of New South Wales and the New South Wales Rural Doctors Network during training, and wrote a couple of articles for some um, rural advocacy uh, publications. And I think it was a chance for me to, I guess, try and share positive experiences of my own um, through rural training and practice to encourage others to do the same. Um, challenges also related to maintaining a work-life balance. Uh, admittedly, I, um, I struggled a little bit in my second GPT term um, and ended up deferring my ACRAM training for six months. Um, just to concentrate on one training college's um, pathways over the other. Um, but as I got through more assessments, I got a better feel for what I needed to do to get through the training and then um, participated in soccer and joined one of the folk bands in town. Um, I guess I, I've gained a couple awards along the way and have been involved with the, um, the photo in the middles from the female doctors group of the RDAA. I think through rural health, you can be really well supported um, not only during your training, but to, to try and help support and promote the future health workforce. And I think it's important um, during your training to discover interests, potentially in rural medicine, of doing advocacy work, because um, that's something you can do very well as a rural doctor. Um, I've got a couple of tips which some of the other speakers have talked about. So I encourage you to find supervisors, mentors, um, get broad range of experience, work on your procedure log early as you can, get your mini CXs done when your training organisation sends out an educator. Um, try and hit around 70% in each topic area when you're studying for the exams. If you can hit 70%, then you're on your way to getting through the exams comfortably. Um, and talk to other registrars. I've gotten tips along the way from coming to sessions like this. Attend the pre-exam workshops, do practice exams, read reports, and have a study group. Uh, I did my AST in obstetrics, and I think um, it's one of the best ASTs that you can do. There's great linkages between different colleges and RANSCOG. It's the best continuity of care. It's unbeatable. You, you look after women um, during pregnancy, you deliver their baby, you look after them as their family comes to see you in the community. Um, it's very rewarding and satisfying. There's a lot of women's health often in the exams and you'll be well across it. Um, you help rural towns keep their maternity services and anyone who's working rurally, you never know if a pregnant lady might show up on your doorstep. So I'm currently a contractor with my GP practice. Um, I do some ONG locums at the referral hospital um, 100 kilometres away. Um, potentially looking at doing a few other short locums around the place, considering medical education, considering getting back more into advocacy and considering um, how involved I might get involved with the practice. And then it's essentially going to be influenced by a number of factors that we all consider in our training decisions. 
And then further learning, I'll be maintaining my qualifications in obstetrics to make sure that I can be the best um, GP OBS doctor I can be, and then looking at further learning, for which there's a lot of different options, but I'm looking to try and maintain or grow my point of care ultrasound skills and potentially look at um, building my um, knowledge and skills in dermatology. And come ask me questions later if you need to. <laughs> Yeah, don't, don't, don't. No, no, I want to seek to the person who's always in the, in the social pages of the Cowra Advocate. Uh, that's it. Um, well, just one thing, like, uh, you've kind of listed off the pros and cons and the, the things that you're able to, the advantages, but what is it that you see when you kind of compare it to other opportunities or even people who are doing uh, similar programs? What's the one thing that you see, you know what, actually I got that through this program at Akram. This, that's the one advantage I have of, of doing my fellowship through them. Or do, doing your um, uh, registration. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the main thing looking at Akram is that it's, um, I'm passionate about rural medicine and rural journalist practice. And I think um, I, I feel that the Akram community has supported me to pursue that as, a, as an end point. And the curriculum itself is the most tailored program that you'll get to be as best skilled you can be as a rural doctor. Great. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time, ladies and gentlemen. Tina Dalton. Uh, keep that applause going as we welcome our next speaker, Dr. Robert Warwick, please. Let me tell you, before I start, he is, this guy's a gun in trivia, by the way, and was an exceptional help to our trivial team last night at the precinct, and we'll be sharing in our winning spoils. Please make him welcome. G'day, my name is Bob Borswick, and I'm an Army Medical Officer and an Akram Registrar. The interesting thing about being an Army Medical Officer is that you get a different and somewhat varied perspective on medicine. One day you're a toxicologist training to treat chemical warfare casualties. The next day you're an occupational medicine doctor assessing whether an injured soldier has a future in the army. The following day you're a retrieval doctor being thrown around in the back of an army helicopter that's whizzing along just above the tree line. And the next day you're a medical educator training army medics on how to assess and treat a casualty in the field. But every day you're giving the best health care you can to the young Australian men and women who have volunteered to serve their country and to put themselves in harm's way. I'm sorry about that moustache. I was a late comer to medicine. <laughs> I'd served in the army as an infantry officer for 20 years before having a midlife crisis and deciding that it was time to do something different. Medicine was my second choice. I actually wanted to be a linguist so I asked the Army to send me for a year of intensive Dari language training. Dari is one of the two main languages spoken in Afghanistan. And the Army, in its wisdom, told me that there's no foreseeable need to have Dari linguists. Two years later, there were 1,500 Australian soldiers in Afghanistan, and I was one of them. And it was while I was serving in Afghanistan that I received an email advising me that I'd been accepted into medicine. So why did I choose Akram? For those who've read To Kill a Mockingbird, you may recall that Atticus Finch tells Scout that you never really understand a person until you climb into their skin and walk around in it. This is often misquoted as to walk a mile in another person's shoes. I've literally walked many miles in my patient's shoes. And before I started medicine, I had a very clear understanding of what was expected of me as an army doctor because it was what I expected from the army doctor when I was an infantry officer. From my first day as a medical student, I knew that I would become an Akram registrar. I knew that when I took my resus bay off the back of a truck, that it would be comprised of one tent, 14 plastic boxes, two canvas stretchers, one MRX defibrillator and heart monitor, and an oxylog ventilator. I subsequently learned that when you're 400 nautical miles off the coast of Western Australia, you need to be a GP, an emergency doctor, an anaesthetist, an obstetrician, and occasionally a psychiatrist. In other words, you need to be an Akram doctor. A 
The problem is that it's not easy being an Akram doctor and an Army medical officer because you're expected to be in two places at once. Last week I worked two days at the Army GP practice in Townsville, three days in a civilian GP practice in Ingham, about 100 kilometres up the road, and then two shifts in the Ingham Hospital ED over the weekend. One of my Army colleagues, also an Akram registrar, spent two weeks delivering humanitarian aid in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, and then returned to Townsville 36 hours before sitting the MCQ in March this year. The same doctor has just returned from Iraq, and he will sit his first CBD assessment next week. Speaking of assessment, I think it's appropriate to borrow from the wisdom of Lord Baden-Powell. You need to be prepared. To be prepared in mind, I highly recommend reviewing the past exam reports, participating in the online stamp study group and the mock exam, and practicing with a study buddy. And read widely. To be prepared in body, find time to do 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise five days a week, while limiting your alcohol consumption to two standard drinks per day, no more than four standard drinks on any one occasion, and with two alcohol-free days per week. I may have broken that rule last night. <laughs> Choosing my AST was easy. The recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan have taught us that if a severely wounded soldier arrives at a military trauma hospital with a pulse and within one hour of wounding, that they have a 98 per cent chance of survival. This is the golden hour. We've also learned that 30 per cent of soldiers who die within the golden hour could have survived if they'd been given appropriate treatment by the first medical responders. And this is the space that I work in as an army doctor. And it's the space that many of us work in when it comes to extremists in some remote and rural hospitals. I'm doing my AST next year. I'm doing it in emergency medicine. I'll be working as an emergency registrar in a tertiary hospital. So, what will I be when I'm a FACRAM? My army commitments have meant that it will take me a little bit longer to, be, to gain fellowship, but that's okay because it's as much about the journey as it is about the destination. When I get my FACRAM, I'll be better prepared to meet the expectations of my patients, to take care of them during the golden hour. I also intend to be an advocate for ACRAM among ADF registrars and an advocate for the ADF with ACRAM. Only 10 per cent of ADF medical officers currently train with ACRAM, and I'll be working very hard to change this for the sake of our soldiers, sailors and airmen. And I'll go well, I'm told. <laughs> my further learning plan. So I'll be using my AST next year to gain either a certificate or diploma in emergency medicine. And I also need to do a bit more work in paediatrics because you tend not to see many children when you're in the army. And finally, and I think more importantly, I'd like to do some work in rural veterans health. Um, like many aspects of healthcare, there are great services available to veterans in the metropolitan areas, but not so much in the country. That's my training journey. I actually think you just touched on a really interesting point there, which, um, which is rural veterans' health and how easily forgotten that is in kind of government policy, in, um, in local policy, and even in just the way that associations build up. What is the what, what are some of the things you've seen that that could be you know changed, or where are the opportunities there? Do you think uh, to to address rural veteran health? Because as you said city has everything and then they move out to the country to kind of live their lifestyle and enjoy the lifestyle but they don't get the support yeah look i think there are, i think there are two challenges the first is that um some well, a lot of people who leave the military do so on you know good terms and they're very happy but there's a small amount of people who don't and some of those who don't try to cut their ties so they 
Um, they walk away from an organisation which actually provides them with a lot of support, and then they don't engage. They don't engage with, with us, you know, with us, their GP or others. So it's about trying to educate young veterans um, that they need to stay engaged with their, their GP or their, the health workforce. But it's also about um, the services because military life, it's a very face-to-face -face occupation. Um, you're living with you know, 100 of your closest friends for six months at a time when you're in Afghanistan or Iraq. And so to not have face-to-face -face service in rural and remote areas, I think is one of the challenges that we have to come, overcome for, for, the, uh, for the young veterans who are living in the rural areas. Uh, I think um, sometimes I think we could just have a plenary session on just your experience alone, like with all of uh, all of you here today. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, there was a question. Sorry, I'm sorry, Nick. Sorry. Uh, the question, in case you didn't hear it, was uh, was about having support. How did you find your study buddy with um, such a great distance? Um, I, I was I was actually fortunate. I've, I went through my exams this year, um, and I also did the dual pathway as well. So I had every six weeks this year I had an exam, basically, which was not much fun. But I, I somehow managed to space my army commitments in between exams. So I no, I just finished the stamps exam when I was sent onto a patrol boat for a month to you know, do what we do off the coast there. So when I was in the barracks, my colleague, who the guy who did go off uh, to Iraq and to Papua New Guinea, he and I would study together. Um, and when I wasn't in the barracks, I had a lot of young soldiers, medics, who were keen for themselves to learn and, use, and I was able to use them as sort of my study aid, for want of a better term. Uh, we do have a question up the back for, to the sound desk. If I could ask uh, the sound desk up the back there, if you could switch on, there's a microphone, a roaming mic that we have. We're just going to go right up the back now. We'll put in some hold music. And there we go. Hello. Thanks so much, Bob. If you uh, wouldn't mind your... just uh, introducing yourself for the room with your question. Sure. Thank you. Sure. I'm Alison. I'm a ACRAM registrar. I'm also on the registrar committee. Um, Bob, thank you firstly for a really inspirational talk. It's lovely to hear such a variety in journeys that our registrars are taking. It's great to hear also that you're doing your advanced skill in emergency medicine. I'd be really keen on your thoughts as to how you feel about an advanced skill specifically for the Defence Force? Gee, here's one I haven't practised. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, we've, the ADF and ACRAM are in the process of trying to build a good relationship. And like some of the people before me, um, the beauty of working with ACRAM is that they are flexible and will help you as an individual and us as an organisation develop something that works for you. And in the case of the ADF, um, we are different because an AST in military medicine for me is different to someone who's in the Navy and in the Air Force. So there's a bit of work to be done, but in my case, what I've been suggesting to my colleagues and to ACRAM is that um, the pre-hospital and retrieval medicine, you know, the army medical, the aero medical evacuation space, the tactical, within that 50 minutes, the first hour, the golden hour, of putting a doctor into a helicopter to plug the holes and keep them alive to get them to the hospital with a pulse. That's what I think would be a, uh, a, an army military AST, which is not to devalue the others, emergency or anaesthetics. We need all of that as well. Um, we need doctors, army doctors and Navy and Air Force doctors who can do that. But in my mind, you know, if I was king for a day, it would be six months of emergency, six months of anaesthetics, and then on the job training with life flight, flying with them until such a time as you were deemed to the standard of one of the life flight registrars and then Army would have an exceptionally good capability uh, in keeping young men and women alive in the back of a helicopter. Uh, I think there's a lot there, so please uh, join me in thanking uh, Robert Warsick for his time.
And uh, last but not least, please welcome to the stage uh, for their experiences, Dr Min Min Mo. Hello, everyone. <sighs> Sorry if my voice cracked a bit. I just recently recovered from flu. So um, first of all, I would like to thank Akram for allowing me to share my journey today with everyone else. OK. So my journey, um, when I had time to reflect on it, came down to three things in my life. The first is my love for obstetrics and gynecology, and the second is um, my love for rural medicine, and the third is my passion to explore further. So I do it. How do I click it? Next, okay. So um, I would like to tell you a bit more about my background. So I was born and brought up in a country in a Southeast Asian nation called Burma, also known as Myanmar. So as you can see on the slide, um, that, that tells everything about Burma. It is the land of Bogota and has a very rich cultural background. And this is our popular Shredegong Bogota, um, that is in uh, Yangon, which is the capital city of Burma. So to tell you a little bit more about my journey, basically, um, is um, it all comes down to my love for obstetric, basically. So um, to start the journey, um, I was trained in University of Medicine to Yangon, Myanmar, and I graduated in 2003. So, so the first thing that come to me is that all I remember is in, two, in, um, in my third year as a medical student, during my, rural, during my rotation to Opsangani as a, uh, in, for four months, I fell in love with Opsangani, basically. So in students those days, we were allocated to four months in each of the, the specialty, which is medical surgery, Opsangani, and pediatric. So during my four months in Opsangani, I spent every night of every night in birth suite, basically. So after my um, after my uh, my day lectures and everything, I'll have a power nap for a couple of hours, and after that, I pack all my gears and head towards birthing suite uh, of the uh, major teaching hospital. So, but on the way, I did a very important job or task, which is getting tea, coffee, and you know all the snacks for the midwives on call, this is very important. So in a way it's bribing. So in return, they allow me to catch as many babies as I want. So this is, you know, that's how, uh, initially I was gaining for just three babies a night, but along the way I catch many, many more, including episiotomy repairs, removal of retained placenta, management of PPHs because they trusted me. And I also have to please the interns and registrars in the birth suite by doing taking bloods, putting cannulas in, take, doing all the uh, medical admissions for them, write everything up, ran errands for them to the point that they love me and bring me to, to do assistant in the caesarean sections. And they give me these little special treats, which is doing the uh, skin repair, letting me uh, doing the sheet repair and all so forth. So by the time I reach my internship, I'm doing cesarean sections, forceps, vontuses, everything independently on my own. And that has been the most happiest time of my life, I must say. And I always want to be an Opsangani uh, from a world-recognized institution. That is my dream. So I work in Burma for three years, which is, as you know, is a third world country, where a very limited facility, and that includes placement in a rural hospital which is very, very challenging because basically you're on call for 48 hours each shift and um, you'll have to do independent appendix perforation, uh, hernia, hydrocele, vasectomies, caesarean sections on your own without, with one nurse and one doorman, apparently. It, like, that's all we have. And you have to do anesthesia on your own, which means spinal. So we learn to do all those during that uh, rural placement rural posting as a medical officer, but I learn a lot. And for me, that love for rural started since then. You're very independent. And at the same time, you have that confidence. And everything, like the help is a phone call away, we have to say, but most of the people there, just like the rural Australia, always refuse to go to tertiary center. So we have to cope everything on our own. So along the way, I still want to pursue my uh, journey or my career as an Opsangani. 
I joined Singapore and I worked in Singapore General Hospital for nearly two years, trying to get into ops and gynae training there. But as a, as not being a local and you know, as an international medical graduate, even though I passed the UK exams, I couldn't get into the surgical specialties such as ops and gynae and, uh, and surgery, but they easily accommodate me into medical stream. But my passion to be an ops and gynae continues, so I move on to Australia, and I work in the first place, which is um, Northsister General Hospital, for one and a half year, and after that, Monash Medical Centre in Victoria for one and a half year, and after the three years in uh, Downsville Hospital, all those seven years as an unaccredited ops and gynae registrar, trying to get onto the ONG program in Australia. So, <laughs> unfortunately. Every year, it's a very popular specialty, so every year I have, like, there are 850 applicants a year and only 150 gets interview. So, and there are only 76 spots across Australia for training position for Ops and Gani. I always get um, interview, shortlisted for interview times five, but I never get offer of training position. So, at the end of um, my Townsville years, you know, all my colleague uh, registrars who are in the training, after six, seven years, are graduating as a consultant. And I, just like um, uh, my previous uh, colleague said, I'm at the end, I don't know where I sh or what I should do. I'm quite stuck and quite depressed that time as well. So I look around and I found Akram, I must say. Because I can still continue uh, doing obstetric that I love to do. And I, with that in mind, I started applying for the RPL and get some uh, prior learning recognized. And I sent a couple of job, uh, you know, uh, seeking emails to some agents. And immediately I got a call from um, Matt Super of um, Cooktown Hospital because they're um, trying to recommend birthing in Cooktown. And so they want me there. So Cooktown, as you all know, is a very beautiful uh, rural, in, like, rural Queensland, not Queensland very famous historical place and also very famous for fishing and beautiful sceneries and also for Cape, Cape York. So this is what our little um, Cooktown multi-purpose health service looks like. And um, we, in addition to Cooktown, we have to cover about uh, three indigenous communities. So most of our patients are 80% indigenous. And um, so like there is never a true cat -E in maternity because all of them has, you know, associated comorbidities, but we did really well. So re reopening of birthing started after I arrived. And um, so, and I joined um, Akram, uh, Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine, and I was trained through RVTS. And I have to say, a give a special thank to um, RVTS for, you know, for their training me to become who I am today. And so, but the fun times begin since I joined um, Cooktown because suddenly labor pain becomes chest pain. And from the obstetric emergencies become um, medical emergency, ophthalmological emergency, pediatric emergency, and so forth. But I really thank um, Akram again for all the you know, useful courses, tier one and tier two courses, which I did as many as I could. And well, here I am. So the maternity service is established in Cooktown. And we do up to third Caesar and fourth Caesar if we have to, depending on case by case. And I don't want everyone to think that we only do cesareans. We also do instrumental deliveries <laughs> very well. Yes. And most importantly, me, my family, and my, my little son who turned six yesterday on my ceremony day. So we're all happy in rural. And thanks, everyone. So. Thank you so much. Um, just very quickly, what did you, just kind of connect the experience, like you've worked in some amazing areas and to even to kind of put my ma on the list, you go, wow, that must be, but to, how do you take those experiences into your learning for Akram? What did you, what did Akram kind of give you that from the experience that you had that you could then develop and and become a better um, a better doctor in your area. Yeah, so that's basically what differentiate Akram from RECGP, I must say, because I did the RECGP as well. I'm on the dual training program. Because with 
Akram, you know, with all my background, you know, especially rural uh, third world country background, I managed to incorporate all those and work as an SMO, which apparently have to uh, cover a wide range of, you know, like holistic approach. So, and with my background experience in the surgery and ops and gynae, you know, so, which means only Akram can actually, you know, incorporate all those. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? There? Any, any questions? We appreciate your time and please join me in thanking Dr. Min Min Mo. And I might have been presumptive uh, when I said last but not least, that was just to lull you into a false sense of security that lunch was not far away. Uh, and it isn't far away. So uh, please welcome, last but not least, uh, to share their story, Dr. Sally Barkler. I apologise, everyone. I'll be brief. Um, so I'm Sally Barkler. I'm a GP obstetrician at Innisfail Hospital in far north Queensland. And I'd just like to start with um, showing you a little bit about my community, a population of about 7,000. Um, we have a little uh, hospital and general practices in town. Uh, we're well known for our cassowaries. Um, so on the top left up there and our tropical fruit. Uh, we have a Feast of the Census Festival every year that um, recognises the wonderful fruit that we produce in the region, uh, where the industry is, is mainly tourism, but also uh, banana farms and cane farms. And um, Art Deco is um, uh, well appreciated um, in the buildings around town. And we have beautiful beaches and a, a small fry in the top right-hand corner, my son. Um, so it keeps me busy. Um, so I, um, I actually grew up in, in southern Africa um, and then um, was originally from Toowoomba in southeast Queensland. Um, then I went to, I did a biomed science at University of Queensland, not knowing what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to help people. I, I lived in the third world in my childhood and um, living in that environment um, encouraged me to, to work in health, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, so then I uh, found um, James Cook University um, through my year off between um, my degree and I was just working after my science degree. And I was quite inspired because of the, the focus on indigenous health, um, tropical medicine and rural health, uh, given my background. And uh, during my time at JCU, I did have the opportunity to do a lot of rural placements to little mining towns such as Moorambar and um, up to Lockhart River that was mentioned yesterday. I went up there and Arakoon and I spent time with the Royal Flying Doctors as well uh, and also ended up in my sixth year going to Innisfail Hospital for my rural term. And so in my sixth year of medical school, I, I did join the Rural Generalist um, Pathway, which is a Queensland, um, at the time it was a Queensland uh, opportunity. And then that would, um, the Rural Generalist Pathway supports you through your early training years, your resident years, and then your registrar years to, to head down that pathway to being a rural GP. Um, and so that, that, that started at the end of med school. I then went to Rockhampton, which is in central Queensland, and completed my um, junior years there. During my junior years of training, knowing that I, I wanted to head down a, a rural pathway, I, I felt as though I needed to equip myself as best I could for working in a rural environment, knowing that there's you know, reduced services, reduced um, um, opportunities to have support and uh, you want to be well equipped with your knowledge and your skill set. So I did a diploma in child health, a certificate in sexual reproductive health and a certificate in emergency medicine during my um, two or three years out of med school uh, while working. I then um, did my advanced skill in um, obstetrics um, as a couple of other people here have done and um, that was up in Cairns in Queensland. And then I went to Roma, uh, which is southwest Queensland. It's about uh, six hours west of Brisbane as a provisional fellow. And then I um, worked in GP practice there and also at the hospital. And I, I'm currently at Innisfail Hospital in North Queensland. So I've jumped around Queensland quite a lot. And those are my dogs, Bella and Jazz. 
Uh, so why did I choose Akram? It was quite a, um, a logical um, progression from medical school because Akram, uh, compared to RICGP, I know you've probably all been on the websites to have a look at the, the training pathway, and they do um, support you to have um, your training and then your advanced skill and, and uh, ending, ending up in a rural hospital well equipped to work as a rural doctor um, or in general practice. I found the team at Akram very supportive. It's been lovely to meet them all and put a face to a name uh, during your time of being in a rural environment, uh, picking up the phone or an email and uh, speaking to the same person when you, when you do contact the, the support team at Akram. Very easy to engage and very supportive. Uh, as um, Tina said, I think you know, being able to sit your exams in your town, as you can see Roma down the bottom there, is quite far from Brisbane and doing my MCQ and um, my um, assessment processes out there was, was really um, very good for time saving, uh, financial as well, and uh, was very convenient. Uh, Akram, I, I've obviously, I was planning to do dual pathway all the way through just to keep my options open. And uh, RACGP still have a lot of resources. I'm still a member of RACGP just for the opportunity to use their resources. Uh, but our Akram had a, a, the Telederm, so I've contacted Jim Muir several times with um, demoscopy questions. The Romeo modules online are, are very helpful, particularly the, particularly the dental uh, modules, there's paediatric modules, and they're very helpful as a registrar to, to just spend half an hour going through those. Um, and so I think Akram, um, as a general practice provider, are very supportive. So the challenges and achievements during my training, I think uh, there's, um, you have the opportunity to have a balance of being quite autonomous um, and having independent practice and a team environment, depending on where you work. The, the towns that we all live in vary in our population. I've met um, people here who are the only doctor in their town. Uh, and then there's larger towns like mine where we have eight SMOs uh, and uh, some of us are part-time. So there are quite a lot of people, but sometimes when it's a long weekend, you might be the only one with your skill in town. So it does vary, uh, but it's also nice to have a great team and it depends on what you're comfortable with and, and where you'd like to work as well. It's, you've got to think about your lifestyle and um, the environment around you. Um, I think uh, what I enjoy about my job is the opportunity to, to utilize the skills that I've learned. Um, and as a, a junior SMO, I think um, it's, it's great to be in a wonderful supportive environment and just gain the, the, the skills and the knowledge on the job as well from your very um, knowledgeable and experienced colleagues who've been working in that town um, for many, many years. Um, so we have a very experienced team in Innisfail and, and I thoroughly enjoy that uh, because uh, it, I'm growing um, very well as, uh, as a practitioner um, from the, my colleagues' knowledge and um, their support. I think um, being a uh, rural generalist, uh, you do have a wonderful diversity of practice. I chose this career because I couldn't let any part of medicine go. And I think we all sort of struggle, struggle with that as well when we end up being a, a GP. Uh, we enjoy knowing a little bit about everything and what we don't know, we, we look up and we, we enjoy learning more about it. Um, there's, there's a juggling act if you, if you do rural general practice uh, because you, you might be working in the general practice and also at the hospital on call. And I think um, it's a very good to be aware of what your GPs, um, the, the, what, to meet the people who are the general practitioners in your town and support them uh, if you're a hospital doctor and if you're the general practitioner to also know the stresses that the hospital doctors face because you're, you're supposed to work as a team for the, the community, not against each other. Um, and, and for your exams, you need to have um, a knowledge of both experiences. So you need to do, know how to do mental health plans and care plans and all of those sorts of things in general practice. But then you need to know the acuity and the, the, um, the knowledge that you need in a hospital environment in the emergency department that you may not be aware of if you do general practice. And other challenge that you'll face, that I faced particularly, was um, balancing um, uh, on call my work, life, studying, and lifestyle. Uh, I, um, when I did my obstetrics, I went to Roma Hospital, and I was very busy there. I worked um, uh, full time, and I was working at the general practice and at the hospital. And I think my experience of, of working 
you know, uh, being very busy prepared me well for the ACRAM exams because they, the, the assessment process was, was very straightforward for me because they just assessed what I did every day. Um, so I think the, these are my tips that we've all given you um, this morning. So the greatest asset is, asset is your diversity of clinical practice. Um, seeing patients in a supportive, supervised environment, you need to ask questions. This is your time that you're learning and you need to be supported and you need to get it right and you need to be a safe practitioner. You need to know your limitations and, and really that will make you a wonderful practitioner in the end because you will have had a, a, a good um, foundations built uh, along the way. So really ask questions and, and gain support from your supervisors and your mentors that you may meet at these conferences and along the way. Um, know your guidelines. Um, there's stamps, online preparation courses, um, mock exams, read how to treat, colleague support and peer discussion. That's just a beach at South Mission Beach where I live, and that's Tinaru Dam just on the, up on the tablelands uh, west of Cairns. So that's my son. Um, I chose obstetrics as my advanced skill because um, I love treating healthy women, well, relatively healthy, um, and I think it's a privilege. I think it's a privilege to be in part, a part of someone's life, as we said before, um, looking after them during the pregnancy, uh, during the birth, and then afterwards as well. It's a, it's a very uh, happy time in people's lives. It's also a very stressful time and vulnerable, and it's, um, uh, as I said, it's very fulfilling to do that job. Uh, the continuity of care, we, we get that with all of our rural patients. You'll see them at Coles, you'll see them at Woolworths, you know, they'll end up servicing a car, they'll be your next door neighbour. It's, it's, it's a great job. Um, so team-based care, you get to work with midwives. There's pros and cons, and I think it's wonderful to work with um, other health professionals and, and appreciate their, their knowledge and what they can bring to the, the table and how they can support the patient as well, because we all have our, our different backgrounds and, and learning. I like the procedural aspect of what we get to do. Um, we get to do caesareans and we get to do procedures in the emergency department and on the ward and look, look after babies. So I think I enjoy that as well. Um, and then the healthy women that I mentioned are not always so healthy. So it's quite interesting. Um, so where to, that's Toby again. Um, I think with, with our, um, our qualification, we have endless opportunities, as you've heard from my colleagues. Um, I, for me, at the moment, I'm trying to just make it relevant to my clinical practice um, and so that I can improve my, myself and be the best GP OBS that I can be for my community. Um, so I've been doing just um, upskilling and advanced near resource courses that we have to do for our PDL and lots of um, um, courses and coming here as well has been a great experience. Um, I'm a, a medical student um, and a junior doctor supervisor in Isvale Hospital, as we all are as SMOs, and we sort of take, I think we should take that um, responsibility quite seriously because if we, if they have a positive experience as I did as a sixth year medical student at Innisfail Hospital, <laughs> we may come back. And um, so that's wonderful. I'm a second year medical student e-mentor for their rural town project as well, and I facilitate the um, study groups, uh, study group for the stamps online um, course. I've been doing that for about two years now, and that's really rewarding. Not only just to meet people, registrars around um, the country, um, but also to provide them with a, a study group. Um, so I recommend um, doing that. Um, that course, I think it's about two thousand dollars, but it's certainly worth it for the eight weeks to prepare you for stamps. And so now I'm working 0.75 and I'm parenting a toddler, so I don't know what's harder at the moment. <laughs> the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sally. Can I just uh, ask a quick question? If there are any questions on the floor, anyone? Uh, nothing there. I just wanted to ask a question. You, you made a comment about work-life balance. How did uh, the uh, proceed the kind of the um, program with Acrum kind of accommodate for that and encourage you to have a work-life balance, especially while you've got kind of a young family? I think it's the people, really. Uh, I think talking to other fellows and. Uh, supervisors who um, have continually encouraged me and supported me with the work-life balance. Uh, as I said, I, I moved to Roma um, and I thoroughly enjoyed working out there clinically. It's 
uh, a much more of a remote area to, than compared to Innisfail. Innisfail is only an hour and a half south of Cairns. And I think the, the rostering out at Roma was, was challenging for me um, to get my work-life balance. So I think you need to find um, uh, the, the, the town and the hospital and the rostering. It, it's quite a complex um, key to, to get the best of everything. Um, but Akram um, was very supportive in, um, in that I met lots of supervisors who, who encouraged me along the way. Right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, Sally Barkler. There is a lot on this afternoon as part of the program, so after we break, uh, make sure you check out the app, and if you are sharing the conversations, hashtag RM18, uh, please join the aggregator and, and share with us your thoughts and your feedback. We, you do get feedback on the, on the sessions, so it's an important opportunity to, um, to rate the sessions as they go through. Uh, this afternoon, some really great uh, thing, media training, and for those of you who do in regional and rural communities often get asked um, to provide a comment to the media, either in a, a newspaper or a local television sense, I encourage you to um, go and uh, have a look at the media training. Uh, and also, the, uh, there is another great one that I noticed, uh, the community-based participatory uh, curriculum, which I think is uh, going to be great this afternoon as well. But there's plenty of great things on, so please participate as much as you can. Uh, the gala dinner, of course, later on tonight. But please join me in thanking our wonderful guests uh, today as part of sharing their uh, training journey. Uh, Sally, Eugenia, Tina, Robert, Min Min and Jude. Thank you for, so much for your time. And we can now break for lunch, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.